Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the IGCSE chemistry topics. This is gases in the atmosphere. Unpolluted air has a composition of about 78.1% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.9 which is usually approximated to 1% argon and about 0.04 carbon dioxide. This topic focuses more on the percentage of oxygen in the air and we're going to look at three experiments on that. For all these experiments, something is going to be reacted with oxygen in the air and then we'll use a specific method to determine how much volume has decreased. This is going to be corresponding to the volume of oxygen used up. The first one is an experiment using copper. In this experiment, two gas syringes are used. One starts off with 100 centimeters cubed which is this one on the left, is going to begin with 100 centimeters cubed, while this one is going to be 0 centimeters cubed. Then we'll position our copper metal in the middle piece and we will heat it strongly using a burner. Then the plunger on this side is going to be pushed in. Remember the copper metal is heated at high temperature and now you're pushing air to go past the heated metal. It means copper is going to react with the oxygen in the air to produce an oxide of copper. That equation is not balanced. So we'll see something that is pink brown being converted into a black solid over time. So as the plunger is pushed, the air is going to pass over the heated copper and this pushing causes the plunger on the right to move backwards so that it can accommodate the air that is pushed in that direction. So the plungers are going to be pushed in sequence, meaning we'll push this plunger again like that so that the air passes over the heated copper to go into the other side. We will repeat that pushing this so air goes over and pushing that so that air goes over. So if we see no more change in the volume of gas within the syringe then we can put the burner off. This means the copper has been converted into copper oxide. Like I said already a pink brown color is going to be converted into a black color. You need to remember the colors of copper and copper to oxide. Also during this process the Brunson burner is pushed back and forth meaning you move it around like that and that and that and that so that all the copper is heated. This provides a faster rate of reaction. Like I said already, as oxygen is used up by the copper, the volume of the air within the syringes is going to decrease. And in the end, if the volume of the air no longer changes, that means all the oxygen has been used up. And again, you need to use excess copper so that all the oxygen can be reacted. So we will let the apparatus cool to room temperature and we will measure the volume of air within the tube. So for example, we can have results like here. Initially, if the volume was 100 centimeters cubed within the syringe, and at the end of the experiment, after we allow the apparatus to cool down, the volume is going to be 79. So the difference is going to be the volume of oxygen, which is 100 minus 79, giving us 21. So the percentage of oxygen in that air is going to be the 21 divided by the original times 100, giving us 21%. Another experiment that can be brought is this one, the rusting of iron. Still in this experiment, we're going to begin with a syringe containing air. This air is going to contain some oxygen. And then we'll put some wet iron filings. This is the iron that is going to be rusted. And it's going to be wet. Remember for rusting to occur, we need water, we need oxygen. So the oxygen is going to come from the air. This is going to be a 100 centimeter scooped conical flask. This conical flask is going to be sealed at the top so that air cannot enter to interfere with the experiment. In the beginning of this experiment, we need to know the volume of air that can fill this flask, the volume of air that can fill within that tube connecting, and the volume of air within the syringe. So we will add up the total volume in the whole system, meaning in the syringe plus in the connecting tube plus in the conical flask, that is going to be the total initial volume. We can find out the total initial volume by putting the cork here, fill this with water to that marked point, also fill this tube with water so that we can know the volume of water that can fill the conical flask as well as the tube that will correspond to the volume of air that can fill that specific space. The space occupied by the iron filings is going to be ignored during the experiment because it will be quite small. So we will allow the setup time because rusting takes time, it could be a week, and then later we can come and observe or check the volume of air within the syringe. Of course, it's going to decrease with time. And in the end, we'll add up the air here, plus the air here, plus the air left in here. So the difference will be the initial total minus the final total. So let's take an example. If we had the volume of air in the conical flask as 1,000 centimeters cubed, this is from your textbook. 
and then the volume of A in the connecting tube to be 12, then the volume of air within the syringe to be 92. It means the total volume within the apparatus at the beginning of the experiment is going to be that. So we'll have 130 plus 12 plus 92 giving us 234 centimeters cubed. Now, if this is the volume within the syringe at the end, it means the total volume at the end is 130 plus 12 plus 43 giving us 185. So the change is going to be the volume of oxygen used up, which is going to be 234 minus 185 giving us 49 centimeters cubed. So 49 centimeters cubed of oxygen has been used up from the 234 centimeters cubed of air that was contained in the whole apparatus. So the percentage of oxygen in the air is going to be 49 divided by the total, which is 234 times 100, giving us 21%. And again, here we are showing the percentage of oxygen in the air is approximately 21%. Next, we go to another experiment that involves using phosphorus. I've seen some questions in the exams where they use some other metal. It could be magnesium and not phosphorus. Or you need to know that these work on the same principle. In this experiment, we'll get phosphorus and put it on an evaporating basin where this basin is going to be floating on the surface of water. We have to mark the initial volume of the water by the side. For example, we can mark it here. We mark the initial volume by the side of the belger using a waterproof pen. And then this bung is going to be removed and we will get a torch and use it to light the phosphorus so that it can catch fire. The phosphorus is going to burn inside the belger. Remember when it's burning, it's using up the oxygen since there was air in here. The oxygen within that air is going to be used up. The phosphorus will burn. Phosphorus oxide is going to be produced. The smoke is going to disappear, dissolve in the water, but the water level within the jar is going to increase. We can compare this and that. Here we see the volume went higher as this side went lower. And that is because water has entered inside here. I would have made it a little bit more, but you can understand the principle. It enters in here because it's displacing the oxygen that has been used up from the bell jar. So when the jar stops rising, the final level is gonna be marked. You will mark again here. And we're gonna use the two markings to find the volume of oxygen that was contained within that. It means in the end, we're gonna invert the bell jar Let's assume this is the bell jar. We're going to invert it like that. We have our two markings, the marking before and the marking after. Remember, I've inverted it, the marking after. So we will fill with water until this level. And after we pour that water into the measuring cylinder so that we can know how much volume that was. Also, we will fill the bell jar until this point, pour that water into the measuring cylinder so that we can find out the volume. The difference between the two volumes is going to correspond to the volume of oxygen. And then we can use that to calculate the percentage. Again, it's going to be approximately 21%. Next, we're going to look at substances that can be burned. Of course, we're talking about the gases in the atmosphere. Some gases react with components or metals. For example, here we have magnesium. This is a very common question. They'll ask you the observations when magnesium is burned in air. Usually magnesium is a ribbon, so the solid is going to be a ribbon-like nature, like that. When it burns in the presence of oxygen, it produces magnesium oxide, which is powdery, so there is going to be an observable difference from a ribbon into powder. And this powder is going to be white, so that is an observation you can see. The flame color is going to be a bright white flame. This is also another observation. And the powder formed is not soluble in water, but a small amount dissolves to form an alkaline solution. For example, magnesium oxide plus water gives us magnesium hydroxide. A little bit is going to be alkaline, although most of it is insoluble in water. So the next one is sulfur. Sulfur burns in oxygen to produce a blue flame. You need to remember the flame color. Also remember when the burning occurs, the gas produced sulfur dioxide is poisonous and it has no color. So you need to be careful. The sulfur dioxide produced will react with water to form an acidic sulfurous acid, as we can see here. So that is the flame color. The next is hydrogen. Hydrogen burns in oxygen to produce a pale blue flame. And the product of this reaction is water, which is a liquid. If you ignite hydrogen in the presence of oxygen, it will explode. As we can see, this is going to be the flame color. So this brings us to the end of this topic, which is about gases in the atmosphere. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.